This is TSN. You're watching TSN, the sports network, coast to coast. This is TSN Inside Sport. The Fighting Irish welcome back one of their own and a Toronto native as Notre Dame's new athletic director. But Mike Wadsworth's homecoming is spoiled by a huge football upset. Tonight, we accompany Mike Wadsworth to his first game as athletic director, and then we speak with him in a feature interview. Welcome to TSN Inside Sports. I'm Dave Hodge. Some ideas for this show come more easily than others. When the University of Notre Dame hired as its new athletic director, Mike Wadsworth, it might as well have been programming TSN Inside Sports for a day, this day as it turns out. You see, Mike Wadsworth is a Toronto native, a former Toronto Argonaut, former CTV broadcaster, prominent lawyer, insurance executive, Canadian ambassador to Ireland. He used to be mentioned as a possible CFL commissioner or NHL president. And uh, oh, by the way, he used to play football at Notre Dame. Mike Wadsworth's first game as Notre Dame athletic director was something we wanted to see and wanted you to see. So our senior producer, Andrew Bernstein, and the camera crew went to South Bend, Indiana last weekend. They came back with two stories, one about Mike Wadsworth and the other about a football game that is now considered one of the greatest upsets in U.S. college football history. Andrew Bernstein then with both stories in one. It's the first Friday in September, and football, after a long, hot summer, has once again returned to Notre Dame. To merely say there is a winning tradition here is a vast understatement. This is the school of the Gipper. Newt Rockney. The forward pass, the four horsemen of Era and Holtz, of Horning and Montana, of more national championship football teams than any other. There are other sports played at Notre Dame, other teams of championship caliber. But they do not play football, and football at Notre Dame is as close to a religion as Notre Dame itself. On this first weekend of the football season, Notre Dame is ranked in the top 10 of all college football teams. Their opponents are the unranked, unheralded Northwestern Wildcats, a team that hasn't beaten the Fighting Irish in 33 years. Last season, the Wildcats had another losing season, their 23rd in a row. And on Saturday, they're supposed to lose one more time. Supposed to lose by at least 27 points. Friday at noon, the quarterback club luncheon, another tradition. A time for almost 3,000 alumni and their families to hear coach Lou Holtz. The coach talks about winning with inferior talent, winning against all odds. I think that football, as I say, is the greatest thing in the world and it is one sport you can learn to do well and a group of inferior athletes can beat a group of superior athletes if you're focused, you understand your role. We are not going to win on talent. We aren't as big, we aren't as fast, we aren't as strong as what we have been in the past. Out of our top 46 players, the top 44 are punter and our place kicker. 41 of them have a year's eligibility remaining after this year. It is a speech made to deflate expectations, a speech which could easily have been delivered by the coach of the visiting Wildcats. When Coach Holtz is finished, he takes his seat at the head table beside Michael Wadsworth, the new athletic director of Notre Dame. This is Wadsworth's first quarterback club lunch as director of athletics. The first of many firsts for Mike Wadsworth this weekend. Listen, wonderful to see you. Thank nice you very much you. for saying hello. We look forward to seeing you during the course of the year. Mike Wadsworth seems at ease in this crowd of Irish alums. It is because he is one himself, a political science grad in 1966. Almost 30 years later, Wadsworth has returned as the head of what is arguably the most powerful and respected sports institution in North America an institution where football is royalty and Wadsworth the new king. Mike Wadsworth grew up playing football in Toronto. He was an all-star at De La Salle High School before being recruited by the Irish, one of two Canadians on their way to Notre Dame in 1963. 
The next year, Mike Wadsworth would be part of one of the greatest seasons in Notre Dame history. Mike was one of our starting tacklers, and uh, I remember the coaches always remarking how Mike was always in the right spot at the right time, never made mistakes. Uh, he was an aggressive, strong player. But I think the thing I remember mostly is that he had such a great intellect at that time that he never made a mistake. He's always seemed to be in the right position at the right time, and uh, was one of our key players during that stretch drive that year. 1964 was the first year of the era of ERA. Coach Era Parsegian took over a team which had won only twice the year before. In his first season as coach, Parsegian guided the Irish to a 9-1 record. Mike Wadsworth, seen here in rare film, was a starter and played defensive tackle. Oh, I remember Mike very well. As a matter of fact, I was very, very disappointed that he was injured. Uh, we thought he was an outstanding football player, and of course when the injury came, and that's the bugaboo for any football coach, and a player as well, and he missed an awful lot of the season, and it was a very exciting one that uh, I'm sure Mike remembers well. Wadsworth's injuries ended his football days at Notre Dame, but not his desire to play. In 1966, he signed with the Argos as one of that team's top prospects. He won the Rookie of the Year award in the Eastern Conference and quickly established himself as a team leader. Many Canadians uh, went through a certain period of learning, whereas uh, Mike seemed to come up uh, with all the skills and the attitude of a veteran. He went on to a career in law, but eventually it was to Ireland where Wadsworth went in 1989 as Canada's ambassador. It's the coincidence of the Notre Dame officials for the first time visiting Ireland at a time when that happens to be my bailiwick and I could help them out that led to the invitation to give this lecture Dick Rosenthal having a hole in his schedule that one day and was good enough to come over and then all, just all of those factors eventually planted the seed and so the torch was passed from American banker Dick Rosenthal to a Canadian ambassador Mike Wadsworth Friday evening at the Wadsworth home at Notre Dame. A reception for friends, former teammates, old coaches, and co-workers. Another pre-game tradition. Era Parsegian holds court, telling stories of victories over Notre Dame while he was still coaching Northwestern. I can see it from two dimensions. I see it when I was at Northwestern and we competed against Notre Dame. And I walked into the stadium and, you know, they make these guys all talk about how you're intimidated going to the stadium. That's nonsense. I reversed that process with our team. This is a marvelous opportunity for us. These fans are in here. You, get, you can make a name for yourself by winning a game sure. here. I mean, so... And that's While the brass was sipping cocktails across campus inside the Notre Dame dressing room, dozens of students participate in another ritual. Before each game, every helmet is painstakingly stripped, taped, and then painted with a mixture containing real gold dust. It's Saturday morning, game day at Notre Dame. The team attends Mass. As Coach Lou Holtz has said, God is an Irish fan. It's now time to go to the football game, a stroll that takes former athletic director Dick Rosenthal and Wadsworth through a tailgate party, another ritual of Notre Dame football life. Michael, God bless you. Welcome to Notre Dame country. Nice Welcome. Welcome. Game time, 1.30 p.m. The frenzy has reached its peak. The faithful are ready to cheer another Irish victory. Mike Wadsworth takes his place in the AD's box with family and a few close friends and awaits his first game as athletic director. The game gets off to a bad start for the Irish. Tailback Randy Kinder fumbles at midfield. Seven plays later, Northwestern scores a touchdown, a six-yard pass from Schnurr to Dave Beasley. Midway through the quarter, it's fourth and seven. 
the Irish gamble. Robert Farmer makes the catch but ends up short of the first down. On the next set of downs, the Irish defense comes up big. All right, all right. Corey Miner, the big freshman play. But with less than two minutes to go in the quarter, Paulus takes a delay of game penalty. Get it snapped. Jesus. Took too long. They took too long. God almighty. Confusion shrouds the Notre Dame offense, and with 50 seconds left in the first quarter, they are forced to take a timeout to regroup. The score, 7 nothing Northwestern. In the second quarter, the teams trade field goals, but late in the half, with two and a half minutes left, Notre Dame has the ball on the Wildcats' five-yard line. Notre Dame missed the convert, but things are looking up. They are running the ball better and are poised for a Notre Dame comeback. At halftime, the crowd, the cheerleaders, and the band are all optimistic. When the Irish take the field for the third quarter, they are down by only one point. But plans for a comeback are quickly dashed. On their first possession, Robert Farmer is stopped for a loss. On the very next play, quarterback Ron Paulus gets sacked. One of four times in the game, the star signal caller is stopped behind the line. The ball is turned over to Northwestern, and on their second play of the half, running back Darnell Autry makes his longest run of the game. 29 yards. The very next play, quarterback Schnur passes to Dwayne Bates. It's good for a 26-yard touchdown pass. The Wildcats are now up by eight points. A small section of Northwestern fans can smell upset. The fourth quarter, only minutes left to redemption or disgrace. In the AD's box, the mood is somber, but with six minutes to go in the game, Notre Dame shows, true to their name, they will not go down without a fight. But with success comes immediate failure. Ron Paulus, taking the snap for the two-point conversion, trips over one of his own linemen. The play is over. The Wildcats remain up by two points. Less than three minutes to go in the game. It's third and eight for the Wildcats at the Notre Dame 43. There is one more chance for the Irish if they can stop Northwestern here. Oh, no. There are whispers in the AD's box. It wasn't supposed to go this way. The new athletic director of Notre Dame is beginning his tenure with a loss. It is not just a loss, but what some are quick to call the greatest upset in college football history. This is a marvelous opportunity for us. These fans are in here. You can, you can make a name for yourself by winning a game here. Dripping with irony, you might say. Uh, Mike Wadsworth has had plenty of time to reflect on that and everything else that happened last weekend. And when TSN Inside Sports returns, we will speak with the athletic director at the University of Notre Dame, Mike Wadsworth. TSN Inside Sports, brought to you by Black & Decker. It's how things get done. When I talked to Tommy Lasorda a couple of weeks ago, he said there were 27 jobs as a Major League Baseball manager. There was only one job as the manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Mike Wadsworth might want to say that athletic directorships at major U.S. universities are many, but then there is the job of athletic director at Notre Dame. For a former student and football player at Notre Dame, that job would stand apart from all others, and the job belongs to Mike Wadsworth. Mike, a real pleasure to talk to you again like this. Uh, of all the jobs you have had or might have had, this one seems the most likely to have come from a dream somewhere along the way. 
Well, Dave, I would certainly agree with that. I never even envisaged myself in this position at Notre Dame, and when the opportunity came about and was first broached in November of 93 through Dick Rosenthal, uh, I was both flattered and, of course, immediately very interested. Well, I'm happy you're still able to be so thrilled about a job that includes a 17-15 to 15 loss to Northwestern. This wasn't supposed to be part of the indoctrination. Yeah, it was not. We would all love to have been off on a better foot, especially uh, this team that is coming off what was a disappointing season last year. And they've worked extremely hard. The coaching staff has as well. And I think they had high hopes for this season. So this has been a big setback for everybody. But, Dave, I think when you take a look at that game, you want to give full marks to Northwestern for what was a faultless game on their part. I think everybody has a lot more respect for them now, and we have to rebound from it, and I think that'll be the real test of how much heart this team has. Can you tell us more about the reaction? Because I think we all realize that anywhere else, uh, this is a monumental upset that is discussed accordingly, but it doesn't change any lives. At Notre Dame, while it is only a game, it is really more than that, isn't it? Well, you know, at Notre Dame, we have survived a lot of different seasons where things have been disappointing. I can go back over the years and give you chapter and verse on that. So, yes, uh, as some people say, it's, it's not just life and death. It's more important than that at Notre Dame. But, but really, it's not. It's, it, it all folds into the background in due course. But certainly on campus, uh, there's been shock on the part of the, the students, the faculty, and staff here. I think everybody was uh, really geared for a much better season. And now they're really wondering about how much talent this team has. I, for myself, still have a lot of confidence in the team. I think the defense, which was the biggest question mark, actually played a, a re very respectable game. They played with a lot of enthusiasm, even though they made some errors. That's to be expected in a young defensive unit. I think offensively, that's where we've shown the greatest improvement, particularly along the offensive line. But somehow or other, even though we did some things well, for example, statistically, we considerably were ahead of Northwestern, but on the scoreboard, we weren't. And you know yourself from years of covering football that that generally comes about because somewhere along the line there were breakdowns. And we had breakdowns with fumbles. Uh, on a third and four situation, there was a bad exchange between center and quarterback that snuffed out a possible drive. And that was the sort of thing that was happening all afternoon. So the offense wasn't sharp, but there were still uh, vestiges of, of good productivity in the offense. And I think we'll see that before the season's out. Well, Lou Holtz will feel pressure this weekend and beyond, and uh, so will the players. What about the athletic director? While you are hardly responsible for what this particular football team does, uh, must you assume some nonetheless? Well, I, I suppose in due course it, it all goes up the line, but uh, I, I really haven't felt the, the pressure of it. I felt the disappointment of it, for sure. I felt the disappointment from the coaches and the players that I've talked about. I felt the disappointment with all the people in this department who take such an active interest in the success of our programs here. And, and you can't avoid feeling that disappointment, Dave. That's very real. But at the same time, there really isn't any pressure. I think Notre Dame, uh, on, in relation to its coaches and its administrators, have long taken the view that you will be given an opportunity to prove yourself. It's not going to be judged game by game or even on a one or two year basis. You're going to give full op be given full opportunity really to establish your program. And that generally means at least a five year opportunity. Well, the intent here was never to focus on one game, as you might have imagined, so let's move on. Uh, is this Notre Dame the one you remember as a, a student and, and player? You know, it's funny. When I arrived here, I set up several appointments on campus to meet with different faculty members that serve on the athletic board. I needed a map, Dave, to get around campus because it's changed so much. There's so many new buildings. When I was here, of course, it was an all-male school, about 5,500 students. Now it's a co-educational university, and its student body, including graduate students, is just over 10,000. Uh, so it's physically and cosmetically very, very different. But having been on campus six months, I can tell you that the core of the university, the environment, the culture of it, is very much the same as it was 30 years ago. And I've been really surprised about how little change in that regard there has been and it's made me feel very comfortable. And I suspect if we had somebody that was from the class of 1935 or 45, they'd pretty much say, say the same thing. But you're in charge of what we might as well call a multi-million dollar corporation. And as nostalgic as you might like to get, I can't imagine you're ever allowed to forget that. Is that the best or the worst part of what the job has become? 
No, I think it's a very interesting part of it. I, I, I mean, everything has a uh, monetary value to it. Uh, this athletic department is not operated and managed in, in order to produce profits. That's not the idea. The idea is we become subsumed in what is the general mi mission of the university, and if we lose sight of that, then we have really no reason for existence on this campus. So if we're not in some way working towards the development of young men and women here on campus, both participants as well as the general student body, then we better find work elsewhere. But in order to be able to do that well, in order to be able to develop the programs that are going to compete nationally, we have to develop the financial stability to get the coaches and to develop the teams to provide the grants and aid to the students uh, that we want to attract here. That has financial realities to it. Fortunately, coming in here, I inherited a very stable situation from Dick Rosenthal, both financially as well as in the coaching ranks. And so I think that I'm in a situation really where I'm being a trustee for a very sound operation as opposed to coming into an operation that has to be turned around. How important is it to remember that a very famous football team and, and tradition is but one part of your life uh, and athletics at Notre Dame encompasses a lot more? Well, I think it's extremely vital to remember that we have 24 varsity sports because every coach feels that his or her team is the most important one. And if they didn't feel that way, we wouldn't want them here. So in order to continue to attract those kind of people and keep them at Notre Dame, we have to make certain that we're supporting them as well. The reality is, though, Dave, that football primarily and bas men's basketball to a lesser extent, they pay all the bills of the athletic department. And as a result of that, providing not only for all other varsity sports, but also for all intramural sports, as a result of that, we must recognize that that's a program that deserves a lot of attention, and we give it that kind of time. Is your birthplace something of an issue? I read one story that called you a Canadian unknown, but a uh, former Notre Dame student and football player arriving straight from Ireland uh, did seem to balance that out. You know, it's, it's funny. I've been interviewed by a number of Canadian uh, media people, and it's been raised in every interview that I've had with a, a Canadian-based paper or station, as the case may be. Uh, I don't recall it ever having been raised directly by any one of the American media people that have interviewed me. One of them may have commented, as you have just quoted, but they never asked me the question. They never were surprised that it was a Canadian. They may be surprised that, that I was a person not known uh, well to the sports media here, but the fact of being Canadian seemed to be incidental, really, to most of them, and that was never really a factor in any of the interviews, only by the Canadian media personnel. Well, here's another one of those questions, maybe the obligatory CFL question. You might have been the commissioner at History Taken a Different Turn. What do you think of its future now? Dave, I'm really not in a position to give an authoritative uh, view on that because I've been too removed from it for so long now. I mean, my last close involvement with the Canadian Football League was 1981, really. Uh, I followed it closely up until the mid-'80s, and then after that, being away from Canada, uh, really for the bounce of that period, uh, I've had only a distant uh, relationship with it. My feeling is that the move into the United States was one that they probably had to do, given the concern about franchises in Canada and uh, the dwindling numbers in attendance there. But at the same time, it seems to me a desperate move that has removed the uniqueness of the Canadian League that allowed it to survive and be given the support that it had for so many years when uh, we were covering it. And, and I think that now that they are ensconced in the states to the extent that they are, it's really taken on more the mantle of the old world football league or one of those other leagues that's gone the way of the dodo bird. I hope that doesn't happen to the Canadian League because we've had many people who have been outstanding Canadians in the ownership ranks, the management ranks, as well as players. And it would be a, a really a, a, a terrible tragedy to lose the history that's so rich with those kind of personalities but I'm afraid if the league doesn't survive, that's what we face. Mike, I always knew the days gone by were preparing us for something. Uh, maybe it was to get so darn busy that we couldn't squeeze in a Pat Marsden story. I, I think we've done it, but there I have mentioned him. Thanks for welcoming our crew on the weekend and for this chat, Mike. Pleasure, Dave. I'll be right back with the facts of the week after this. TSN Inside Sports, brought to you by Black & Decker. It's how things get done. Our Facts of the Week comes from Edmonton and contains praise and criticism for last night's show that went behind the scenes at the Canadian Open. 
The program accurately portrayed what is significant about the Open. It's a huge team effort geared to put a superb golf course on display, and Canadian golf is a beneficiary as our tournament organizers and volunteers create a lasting impression on PGA Tour executives and players. But to close the show with a not-so-subtle reminder about who is not attending is grossly inappropriate. Well, I sit before you chastised, but still puzzled that any examination of the quality of a Canadian open field is considered out of bounds in any other sport if the four biggest winners of the year, as in Crenshaw, Pavin, Daly, and Elkington, were not present, it would be okay to say so, and uh, quite natural to be disappointed. A TSN sports bag does go to Edmonton with our thanks for opinions pro and con. You can send yours to Suite 100, 2225 Shepherd East in Willowdale, or fax them to us, 1-800-563-0845. I'm Dave Hodge. We thank you for watching us on TSN Inside Sports.